What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest has led rowing teams across the Atlantic, not once, but twice, and the Pacific Ocean once, with the second time being the fastest ever recorded. He's a teacher at the London Business School, Columbia Business School, Wharton, and Emory. He's the author of two books, one of which I just finished reading a couple of weeks ago called What If? He's the founder and CEO of Latitude 35. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Caldwell. Welcome, Jason. Thanks, Dan. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you. This is going to be great. Yeah. So when people think about someone rowing across the ocean and doing all these other feats of endurance as you have, they don't necessarily think of hospitality. And just to, I just want to bring the audience up to speed of where I encountered you for the first time. It was at the Hospitality Design Summit um, it, in Lake Tahoe. You were there speaking and telling about one of these journeys. I used to row in college. So when you first started talking about rowing and just the grueling physicality of it, I actually had like a panic attack. I was like, oh my God, why is this guy speaking? What's going on? <laughs> but then as you started talking, there were so many moments through your story that made me think of like the ultimate experience of hospitality because there was nothing. You were in the middle of the ocean, stripped down, so bare bones. And there was this moment that just made me want to learn more. So I just want to say thank you for being here. And I'm so impressed by all of your, your feats and endurance and just kind of the, 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 the course that you're plotting and just thank you. Thanks. You know, I got, I've got a similar story. It's, you know, you came up to me after that talk that when we met each other, I'm thinking to myself, you know, these guys, I've got this, you know, podcast a little bit, how do you speak on it? Defining hospitality. I'm like, I can't help this guy out. Like this, this is, but then as we started to get to know each other and have some conversations and I thought, wow, what a unique way to start talking about some of this stuff. And I've just found myself really looking forward to this conversation because you've challenged me to start thinking about how I lead these teams. And, um, so I'm, what I'm excited about is that a lot of this conversation is going to be kind of, I think I'm going to be pioneering some of my thoughts. I'll be kind of at the fringe of my thought process here. And that's, what's really kind of exciting about it. So thank you. Oh, uh, oh great. And I, so I'm just so grateful as well. So as we get into it, and when I think of like hospitality, you know, there's hotels and restaurants and there's some sort of, you know, luxury and there's just, it's just, there's a whole level of comfort here. But what struck me about you and your experience was you're in the middle of the ocean. There's really nothing. You're eating like dehydrated food. You're rowing for two hours on, two hours off for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. And given that, how do you define hospitality? Yeah. You know, I mean, when I think of hospitality, I'm thinking of from from my experiences uh, at hotels, at at restaurants, and that stuff, and so I, I I'm always as the person who's who's being catered to. Um, but you know, for me, the definition of hospitality is really ways that I can create a level of comfort, whether that's a physical comfort, a mental comfort, or an emotional comfort. Um, for people. And in my world, my people are my teammates. And as leaders, of, uh, as a leader of these teams that row across oceans and do all these extremely uh, dangerous and endurance driven things and, and incredibly difficult, um, I have kind of the burden, but also the opportunity and privilege to find different ways that I could create that comfort. Um, you know, the obvious one is this physical comfort. And I'll, I'll, we can talk about all three of those on kind of let you drive that, but, but this idea of physical comfort, right. On, on a, on a, in a boat, which is very uncomfortable, but this, this emotional and mental comfort or almost like this, um, security or safety that teammates can have in you and the rest of the team and the boat and the equipment. It's actually something that may be one of the most important aspects of, of, of kind of my leadership journey. So, and when you think about the, or when we all think about physical comfort and experiencing hospitality, usually there's 
a comfortable bed. There might be a down comforter or at least clean sheets. What you guys in the audience might not realize is basically Jason and his team are rowing across a fiberglass, across the ocean in a fiberglass boat. I think it's about 10 meters long. There's four men full grown, like usually rowers are very tall. Walk us through how you're able, walk us through the physical environment where you were and how you found comfort in that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So let's, yeah, let's set the stage a little bit with ocean row. Yes. Because I can't imagine too many people listening today are, are familiar with ocean rowing. So, um, as you heard Dan say, I've, I've, I've rode across the Atlantic twice. The second time breaking the world record is the fastest team ever rode across the Atlantic. That's a 3000 mile journey from essentially the, off the coast of Northwest Africa, Southwest, so it's 3000 miles to the Caribbean. That's our first race and I've done twice. And then just a few months ago, I completed and broke the world record ran across the Pacific, which that race starts in San Francisco and goes right through the Golden Gate Bridge to Hawaii, to Waikiki. So we're talking about, and that's 2,400 miles. So we're talking about large distances. So obviously we've got this discomfort because you're rowing thousands of miles. And then you're in this boat, like you said, we've got a 30 foot boat, more or less six feet at its widest. And you've got four big guys such as myself, not just rowing in this boat, but living in this boat. You know, this is our home for the foreseeable future. Just so you know, the first time I ran across the Atlantic took us 51 days. The second time, which was the world record, was 35 days. And this one here in the Pacific, uh, we broke the world record and was 30 days. So we're talking about a month or well over a month of not just rowing, but living. And how that rowing and living uh, kind of is, is dissected is that um, for teams like us that are trying to, you know, win races and break world records, you've got to keep that boat moving at all times. So, so we've got four people on this team and two people are rowing while the other two people are resting inside these very tiny, tiny coffin like cabins. And you're rowing two hours on two hours off 24 hours a day throughout the entire crossing. So you as an individual are responsible for a minimum of you know, 12 hours of rowing a day. And that's if everything's going well. And you're doing that for an extended period of time. And, you know, just to give other context, because I sometimes incorrectly assume that people know what I do. Um, there's no boat following us. We've got everything that we need. We're desalinating seawater for our drinking water. We pack all of our food, which to your point, Dan, is 75% dehydrated meals. It's kind of like, you know, just not necessarily that nutritious stuff. Um, you've got, uh, you know, you've got all of your life-saving equipment on board, such as like your, your sat phones, your VHF radio, your chart plotters, all these kinds of things are going to help you get to the finish line, um, safely. And all that stuff is being packed onto this boat. So while you are rowing 12 hours a day, which is in itself very, very difficult, sometimes the 12 hours that you're not rowing, those 12 hours of simply existing could be the hardest 12 to the hardest hours of the entire crossing. Um, you've got responsibilities when you're not rowing, like taking care of your own body and obviously eating, drinking enough, and then, and then getting sleep. But you've also got responsibilities to the boat. You've got to fix things that are broken, which inevitably happen all the time because salt's being introduced to everything. Um, you've got to keep things clean, you know, to, to stay off infection. And then you've got responsibilities to your teammates. And this is where we're kind of getting into this idea of, of, of creating comfortable environments in a very uncomfortable world that we're in. And that's for those responsibilities, like picking up an extra ship for a teammate that's extremely seasick or helping them get down food and water, making food for other people when you've got the jet boil and stuff already out. So you're trying to be more efficient with your cooking. And so you're cooking for other people, um, you know, going through the med kit and getting stuff that somebody might need who's very sick or who's injured or something like that. So you've got responsibilities to yourself, responsibilities to the boat and responsibility to your teammates, all in those two hour little segments that really you, all you want to do to be fair is to be selfish, eat and sleep, but you have got so much more to do. So well, I want to, I want to, yeah, I want to, I want to clarify something for the audience also, because, you know, Jason had mentioned that it's four people rowing two hours on two hours off, but in the story that he told me, Two got, one guy left the boat, one guy got really, well, two guys left the boat. So they got, one got really sick. The other one just had like a mental freak out. So there is really only two of them and they were rowing for a time. 
And then at one point that you, your tempers were flaring, but then what struck me and you wrote this in the book, and I don't remember you saying this, um, in the, in your talk that you were giving, but you said, and I, I want you to tell the story here because you said in those 10 minutes, Tom, the other guy rowing with you, he was preparing a meal. He asked you what you wanted and what this, what you said, what this small team needed more than anything else was community. And that's really where I, this lightning bolt went off of like, mm. oh my God, this is the most uncomfortable thing in the world, but you created this community and then your performance improved your, 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 the, your outlook on life improved and you just, you performed and you started passing other boats. So tell us about that. That's crazy. Yeah. This is where you really helped challenge me to kind of define this idea of how we were, as you said, creating, creating a community and, I, you know, looking at through this lens of hospitality, using that word is such an interesting way. And since we've talked about it, it's just been fun. So this is the scenario that happened and you heard, you know, this is, we're talking about the first ocean crossing I did. This is back in 2015. This is the row that went in many ways so wrong. You know, we're trying to win this race. We're trying to break a world record. You know, we're trying to do it in 30 days or less. We do it in 51 days. Two of our teammates get evacuated due to illness and injury. And one guy just straight up quit. So, so, you know, 600 miles in a 3000 mile row, one guy so ill is evacuated onto a sailboat because he's in dire, in dire need of, of IV. He can't keep anything down. Another one of our teammates just says, look, I'm taking, I'm going to pull the ripcord on this thing. I'm going to take the opportunity because there's a sailboat here. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. So you've got, you've got two guys leaving. So it's myself and my remaining teammate, Tom. And, you know, we're, we're, we're 600 miles into this 3000 mile race. We're, all, we're also wearing 24th out of 26 teams. We're in 24th, we're in third to last place. I mean, you know, nobody who's watching this, this race, by the way, you can follow it on a smartphone. There's an app for it, but nobody who's following it on this app thinks that we're even going to finish. Like this is just a foregone conclusion that these guys are going to have to quit at some point too and have to be rescued at sea. So this leaves Tom and I with this unique challenge of like, are we like, what are we trying to do here? We're a two man team and a boat made for four or five people. We're getting manhandled. And of course, to make things worse within the first few days of us now rowing just by ourselves, just the two of us and a, and a boat that's way too big, a hurricane smashes into the Caribbean and is moving kind of northeast and the outskirts of which is affecting us. So we're talking about tropical storm type conditions, which isn't that big of a deal if you're driving to and from work, but certainly is when you're on a 30 foot rowboat in the middle of the Pacific Atlantic Ocean. So we're seeing these huge walls of water, these huge waves that were literally going up and, and surfing down at times. I mean, it's scary stuff. And so we spend like the first kind of three days. And by the way, we're still doing two hours on, two hours off, except for the two hours that you're spent rowing, you're by yourself while the other guy's in the cabin resting. So you're literally, it's all this solitude. So it, 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 it's the antithesis of hospitality at this point. Like you, you're alone, you're scared, you're hungry, you, you're tired, you're miserable. You're absolutely miserable. And we, we deal with that for about three days, just this two hours on, two hours off, on the deck, just getting pounded by the storm, waves hitting you, salt sores everywhere. And after about three days of that, I'm not, you know, to be fair, I'm, I'm done. Like, I, I honestly wish I would have quit. And I'm a pretty tenacious athlete and like not a lot makes me think about quitting, but I, I'm at my lowest point in my, in my life, like, let alone just this race, you know, we're probably... 10 days into this thing at this point and, uh, and about four days of just being Tom. And so I'm kind of, I've got this last, I've got the 6am to 8am shift and I'm just, it's like two minutes until my shift's over with and I'm just miserable. I've got my foul weather gear on and I'm just trying to row and I can hear the cabin door behind me kind of creak open and, uh, and you know, it's Tom kind of getting ready for his shift and, um, up to this point, essentially, we have been like kind of ships passing each other in the night. Every two hours, we spend a couple minutes in each other's company. That's it. The guy coming off the rowing ship would say things like practical things like, hey, try to keep the bearing between 260 and 265. And, you know, it's raid pass over the first 45 minutes. Looks like it's okay now. Bring your foul weather gear out, this and that. Just practical stuff. And then the guy coming on ship, the guy that's about to row would kind of offer these words of empathy. It was just kind of our, kind of our little routine that we had just hang in there. Great job. Like go get some rest kind of thing. 
So when you're two guys in this desperate situation, like that's what you're clinging on to. You're kind of clinging on to these words of empathy. So as I'm about to come off the shift in the early morning here, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to hearing Tom's, you know, kind of words of, of empathy, so to speak. And in that moment, what he chooses to say, and it probably wasn't planned or anything, but he just says like, you know, hey, w- w- what do you want for breakfast? And I just thought this to be such at the time, it, it ins, like, uh, insensitive comments, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm at my lowest. I'm, I'm a shell of my former self. We've got, we still got, you know, thousands of miles to go. And this guy is just asking me what I want for breakfast. And I just thought it was so insensitive at first. And I was about to kind of turn around behind me and like yell at him for this comment. But before I do, at that moment, I was like, yeah, I'm actually pretty hungry. I'm starving over the course of that crazy night of that storm. I didn't eat anything. You know, maybe just a handful of nuts or something like that. So instead of saying something I probably would have regretted later on, I, 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 I turn around, I say, you know, well, I would, I'll take the chicken risotto, which is just a freeze dried meal that I happen to like. I still do actually, it's pretty good. Um, and then he kind of just, you know, he kind of goes along with it and says, well, I would have the spaghetti bowling news, which is one of his meals that he likes. So. Um, so and then he kind of follows up and says, like, do you want me to make you some coffee? And I'm just thinking like, yeah, of course. And then he says, do you want me to, you know, sprinkle that powdered hazelnut creamer in it and stuff that you like? I was like, yeah, this is the best part. What are we talking about? So in this moment, he makes a deal with me. He says, look, I'll tell you what, if you row an extra 10 minutes, which, you know, it's not lost on me that that's 10 minutes of this ship, I will make, make you breakfast and then you don't have to worry about it. You know, and you could just you get off your shift, eat it and go to sleep. Now he knows that that's asking a lot of me, but one of the things that him and I had done to know about each other is that see, I would much rather put the muscle into the row where he likes the cooking ask me. He likes the task of cooking. You do that rather do that than row. I'm a much bigger guy than him. He was already losing a ton of weight. He was getting, he was, you know, he's, I, I was already getting a little nervous about how much weight he lost. So we make the deal. And after he finishes, we just literally, without any hope or agenda, I just stop rowing. I like kind of pull the oars in. So we're not moving. We're actually not making progress anymore. And I turn around in my seat and I face him. And we just kind of sit and we just eat breakfast together. Again, like we didn't plan it. We've never done this before. It's just he made the food for both of us. I need to eat. I'm starving. He needs to eat too. So we might as well just eat together. And so we do. And like for 30 minutes, we just kind of like, we share time together. We just have, we have a meal together. That's what it was. It was breakfast, just the two of us. And we hadn't seen each other essentially in three days, you know? So if you can imagine like just almost not talking to anybody for three straight days, I mean, that type of solitude is just not something we're used to. And so we find ourselves like, I'm telling them about my night. I said, I fought, you know, flying fishing in the face last night, if you can believe it. Like, and, and, and he's kind of sharing his stories and, and before we knew it, like, you know, 30 minutes had gone by quite quickly. And, you know, we, we said, all right. So we finished our meal. We started to go back into our two hours on the larger ship. But the, the change that took place after that moment was huge. It wasn't, it was subtle. It was, it was that there was a glacial like shift in the, 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 the composition of our, of our team of two now, but it was so, it was so palpable. The first thing that happened really was that we started going faster. So like most people didn't even think we'd finish this race, but over the course of the next 41 days out to sea, we moved from 24th place and no one thinks we're going to finish all the way up to 11th place. And not only finishing, but setting American record as the fastest American four man team to ever row across. Cause we started as a four. So we had to end as a four categorized as a four. The other thing that happened is that every single morning at 8 a.m., we had breakfast together. And I rode a little longer on that shift. We cooked a little more and we just did exactly that. We pulled the oars in and we didn't worry that we weren't making progress towards the finish line while other people out there were. And we sat there and we had this meal together. And we were, uh, to your point, we were ha- we were creating this community. And I think the biggest shift, if I could just if I can pinpoint it was that, you know, before that first breakfast, we were scared of everything. We were scared of the ocean. We were scared of failure. We were scared of dying. 
And after that first breakfast, it was, we were more scared of letting each other down than we were of anything else. And that was the biggest shift that took place on the boat. Every hour that I was rowing leading up to our next breakfast, I was afraid of letting Tom down. I was rowing as hard as I could, not as hard as I thought I could, which is a difference. And he was doing the same. And this idea of, I like, we kind of leveraged each other's human emotion was that that was to me, the, the real, the real recipe to our success. And from that finish on, I've now gone on to row two more oceans. The Atlantic again, break a world record. The Pacific this year broke the world record. I've trekked through the oldest desert in the world. I've rowed from Spain to the Balearics. So I've done all these big, big adventures, small adventures throughout since that, that film was six years ago. But from that moment on, that sense of building community, and if we want to bring it into this idea of hospitality, has not only never left it, never been too far from how I build and train and lead teams, it's become kind of a cornerstone of yeah. how we do this stuff. So and anyway, Jason, I, I, I want to, so, no, yeah. I wanted to, so it's really just a metaphor for life as well, I think, because we all go through just getting through the day, doing our thing. And it's oftentimes for me anyway, I need to have and schedule in these moments of mindfulness and just reflection and just being self-aware. And you basically created a mindful moment in the middle of a hellish experience, drowning in fear, and you leveraged your emotion to create this pause, if you will. Yeah. So what I'm curious, and that pause created this idea of community, or you strengthened your idea of community. How are you, how have you taken that idea of that pause and that mindful moment into all of your other endeavors? Yeah. You know, you call it a pause and I actually have a, a phrase for it now, as I call it a gathering point, it's a, a gathering points. They're opportunities that we are given to realign ourselves, both with our kind of our North star, but also with our team's purpose and mission statement. And that's all it is to be fair. It's an opportunity that you can choose to take or not to take. And that's something that has really stuck with me as I build the teams in the future is that I believe that as a leader, you've got to create as many of those gathering points, as many of those opportunities to help your team realign with themselves as you can. Now you won't, and some of them are very formal, like, Hey, we're going to have this breakfast moment. You know, I mean, we don't, I don't do that with my other team. We have our, it is organically grown into whatever that team is going to do. Some are as formal as we're going to stop and pause and have this. And sometimes it's as informal as just taking a second to ask the teammate a question that you didn't normally wouldn't have time to ask them or didn't think you have time to ask, or just to check in with somebody and just see how they're doing. So if you ask, if you're asking what I've done, bringing it forward is that's what I've done as a leader. The very least thing I can do as the leader of these teams is to create opportunities for that alignment to take place and that kind of leveraging of human emotion to start to build up. It's a, it's a community thing. So, you know, I, I, it, it works in different ways. We have at 10 AM on this last row every morning at 10 AM, even if you weren't rowing, the other two guys had to pop out and we'd have a check-in with everybody and everybody on in the middle of the ocean, when there's a lot going on, I didn't care what was happening. You, everyone got out there from 10 to 10, 10. Everyone got a chance to say, this is how I'm feeling. This is, and I'm asking you for this, you know, for this favor, or I, I need help with this. So and it, it was strong and powerful. Speaking about that 10 minutes, one of the people that really changed the way I, I run, I run businesses, is this guy, Vern Harnish. He created this entrepreneur's organization I'm involved in. He wrote this book called Rockefeller Habits. And within that, one of the most important thing that Rockefeller did with his number two is they had a daily huddle and really it was like a, they had lunch, but oftentimes like in my company, it's, you know, we have a 12 minute thing. Hey, what are you up to? What are your metrics? Where are you stuck? Share a value story about someone else. And then a one word close. But oftentimes I find that just sh someone sharing where they're stuck as a leader, you're like, oh, I can help you solve that really easily. And it's being, creating that moment of vulnerability has been really powerful for me and just a good way to always keep in sync. And when you think of the, where you call it a gathering point, I'm curious, um, do you have any examples of 
when you've introduced this gathering point to your clients or your teams, what are some of the measurable improvements that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think one, one of the things it does the best at is it builds trust. And while these types of kind of emotionally driven metrics are difficult to actually measure, you know, as a team, whether trust is being built, built or if, if it's deteriorating. And, and I think one of these check-ins are making people feel as though Jason cares about me, cares about what my goals are. We obviously have a group and team or organizational goal or path, but he cares that my personal goals are also being met at the same time. And so I think that that is that, that trust enables, and it's a selfish thing too, for me to do. If my people trust me, then they will tell me the truth when they need stuff, when things aren't going well, if they don't trust me, they won't. And that's just human beings at our most basic level. The other thing I think that it's really important to, to consider when we're talking about these gathering points is this idea that it can't just be lip service you're paying to, you know, you can't just say, oh, we do this every day. Okay, let's go through it. It, 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 it can't be a box that you check. Did we do, did we do the group check-in today? Okay, good. That's good. Oh, we did do it. Now we'll just do it tomorrow then. It can't be that. It has to be emotionally led, emotionally driven and authentic else people will not treat it with the gravitas that it deserves and that it needs in order to be effective. I was I once Oh, well, wait, to, to build on that one, when we share, a, we have these very specific core values. And when we share a core value story about someone else on the team or a client or just anything else, it also introduces that it's not just checking a box. You really have to think and tap into your emotion. So you tell something about whether you're caring, how did they adapt and improve? Um, how are they tenacious? How are they organized? Or how did they do what they say, do what they said and said what they meant? So. Yeah. In a way, you're checking a box by doing it, yes. but to make it more feeling and caring based, how do you do that in the middle of the ocean? That's what's difficult. And that's where, you know, going in and building a team full of the right people, not just the best people is something that I'm always trying to constant challenge and something I'm always looking for is like, look. Lat 35's racing teams now have some notoriety. We get a lot of people that want to be part of these teams because they're highly organized. We're doing exciting things. We've got all this legacy behind us. They're well funded, you know, all this type of stuff. But, you know, it's easy to just pull the biggest, strongest athletes out of the hat and just say, these are the guys we're going for. And I've done that before. And it's an absolute, you know, it's, it's miserable finding the right guys for these, for these adventures. And by the way, we have an all women's team that's going next year. And that's what I'm really excited about is that I'm trying to prove to everybody out there that, that it's not me that's doing this, this process. Everything that you and I, Dan, are talking about right now is part of the process of building and maintaining these great teams. So we've got an all women's team that we just finished putting together actually a couple of weeks ago, and we're bringing them in the journey, but now it's not me. You know, I'm not the one that's going to be creating those gathering points out there on the water. So um, they're going to have to do it themselves. So I could just help coach them in this situation, but in the end, I'm not wrong this with them. And that's, that's been a good, good kind of exercise for me to do is to kind of step back and let this happen. But when you're out there, um, it doesn't have to be grand, you know, like sometimes we're all scared. We're in a bad situation. You might just be checking in with the guy right next to you, right behind you as we're roaming, saying, are you all right, Duncan? He goes, I'm all right. You know, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that. All right, why don't you just take five minutes to yourself? Like, I got you. Let me just roam for a second. Something as small as that is, is to me, that's a gathering point. And that's just that's building trucks. Other times you've got a beautiful day, winds at your back, sunny skies, you're dry, everyone's laughing, having a good time. And you can have kind of these more robust gathering points. But the fact is that you got to be consistent with them. And you're right. You, you, I think you nailed it, Dan. Like to a certain extent, it does feel like a box that you have to check. But as long as that, as long as that in the moment, it doesn't feel that way. And I, I was once told, by, by a mentor of mine, which I, I've never, I've never forgot, which is he said that he said, quality time is a myth and um, it's not about quality time. It's about quantity time. Quality time is only defined after you've already done it. No, nope, you should never go into a situation saying, I want to make this the best weekend with my kids I've ever had, or I want to make this the best practice we've ever had. Or, you know, this is, you don't, you just simply show up for your children every single day 
without any kind of a hope or agenda other than I'm there for them. And then the quality time is defined later on. You look back and say, wasn't that an amazing weekend? And it's amazing, like, and I, I, as a father of a two-year-old, I haven't quite experienced this yet, but it's amazing what I remember and talking to my dad, which were great moments in my childhood. He's like, God, I, bar- I forgot about that time. Well, it meant a lot to me. He didn't go in those situations. And I think that's the same thing when we're talking about how we're leading our organizations and we're trying to create this, this, this idea of, of, of high performance teams doing really special things in whatever industry you're on is don't worry about going every day, just being the best leader, creating the best experience, just be consistent for them every day. And that stuff will happen. And I really, I really take that to heart. And sometimes it's not easy to do um, because sometimes consistency is harder than, than trying to be like an A plus every now and then. So. Well, consistency, I think, is the key to so many things. But again, you could just be walking through, but to make it a meaningful gathering point, as you say, is pretty tremendous. And we, I want to push back on you. And one thing you said, you said it's not you. But if I, when I go back to the book and reading about your experience with your coach at Sonoma State, which for those of you who know, like they have a, a decent program now, but on the West Coast 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't that big of a deal, but you went in it and you made your way to the Vesper uh, Boathouse, which is in Philadelphia, which is like, is it the premier rowing organization in America? Yeah. Not one of. Yeah. So, but your coach said to, when he was trying to, in essence, lobby the Vesper coach, I forget their names. He said that you are the grittiest person human that he's ever met like you're it's almost like you're off the scale off the charts on it and that's why they should give you not someone from yale or princeton or dartmouth uh a run at this so even though you say it's not you there's something really special about you with your grittiness so my question is like two part like where did that grittiness come from and then as you're selecting and recruiting and maintaining your teams how do you get everyone to tap into that grittiness because most people are not like you yeah, I mean, well, you really did read my book, Dan. Thank you so much. You're, you remind me of parts about it that I haven't thought about in a while, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, where, first of all, I'll answer that first one. Where did the grittiness come from? I mean, I, I, my answer will be one way. I'm sure my, my parents would answer a different way and my coaches would answer a different way. But I think, you know, I grew up not being, I was a good athlete, but I was, I was never the best athlete. And I found early in, in my career that I could, my biggest talent was to, I could outlast this endurance. Um, you know, I grew up playing baseball and football and endurance, um, is good in those sports, but it isn't weighted as heavily as a, a sport like rowing. And so when I got into rowing, what I found is, you know, and by the way, at Vesper, at, you know, six foot four, 215 pounds, I was the shortest and lightest guy on the team. I mean, I'm small for elite level rowing. So when I get onto big teams like that, I knew that what I could do is I could outlast people. You know, I, I could, I could, I could, I could practice longer and harder. I, I, you know, I would do those kinds of things. And so endurance became the way that I made teams and then became the way that I made top boats was that it, I was, I was always going to be the guy that was going to be there for you, take an extra practice with you. If you need extra strokes, if you need to go to the weight room with you. You know, the, I had I had physical endurance, but I was also also somebody you could rely on for that. Like you could call me in the middle of the night because you're at a bar when you shouldn't have been out to begin with. Because we have practice the next morning, coach found out here, you know, in deep trouble, and I'd go pick you up from that place. You know, like that type of that be, started to become my legacy. Jason Caldwell's legacy was he's there, like he will always be there. He will never not be. And that is how I have built on my success. So that grittiness and that kind of, that idea that I'm just kind of, kind of always going to be there has, has boded well for me. So identifying that for me early on and then leveraging that is how I've gotten my success. There are many, many rowers in this country that are more technical savvy than me, that are bigger than me, that are stronger than me. But I, I think you'll find you'll be hard pressed to find one that'll last longer than me. And so that was it. It's also interesting because now as you're saying that, it made me think of a part where it's, I think it was at Sonoma State, you were, you were kind of like the de facto leader of your team, but you were almost as if a dictator, right? You'd got to do this and you'd think less of people if they weren't working as hard or whatever. But then at Vesper, 
there was this one guy who just won every seat race and a seat race for those of you who don't know you have usually two boats and you're always trying to tweak it and find out who's rowing on the best one but he won every single one he could not lose and i feel like that was a real transformation in you tell us about that inner encounter with the guy who would win it all the time how did you approach him what were you feeling in that vulnerability and then how did you change yeah that's the thing is i you know, you're right. They met Sonoma State. I come into rowing late in my, my collegiate career. I played baseball at Sonoma State, got injured, couldn't play anymore. Get into rowing late in the career. And I have a chip on my shoulder, you know. I feel like I'm too good for this sport. And then when I start to have success, if you didn't seem like you were working as hard as me in this very interdependent sport of rowing where we're all in the same boat, wasn't like pitching, um, you know, I would be upset with you. And so I was like, I was given the captain role by the coach because I was the oldest guy on the team. I was the biggest guy in that team, but leadership is not a title. Leadership is inherently in us to do. So you don't have to be, and I was just the captain, but I wasn't the leader, you know? Um, and I think I learned the difference between that. When I went over to Vesper and got a spot there, they accept, uh, you know, 16 people from around the country. I'm, by far the least experienced, the smallest guy. In a lot of ways, I have no business being there, but I get a, kind of a one summer shot. And um, another guy that was on the team, and his name's Don White, he's from Dartmouth, went to row at Dartmouth, which is a great school, uh, especially for rowing. But in terms of like the Ivy League, it's like not the best. You know, the Princeton, Harvard, Jails were kind of the, the better schools. Um, he wasn't that big. Of course, he was bigger than me because everybody was, but he wasn't, he wasn't the biggest guy to have the. He wasn't the fastest on the rowing machines, but this guy was in the stroke seat of the top boat and nobody could knock him off. And the stroke seat of the top boat is like often considered you are the best rower. You're the most productive rower. That's what I should say. Meaning you move boats better than anybody else. And I noticed that he never got knocked off because in the seat racing thing that you kind of alluded to, whenever he'd be challenged by another rower, he would always beat the other guys in the seat races, never, ever lost. And so I'm thinking, if I'm going to stay on this team, if I'm going to want to get comfortable here in Philly, I got to figure out what this guy does. He's obviously not the biggest guy, but he's the best in what he does. So um, I find out, I talk to him, I kind of get to know him, buddy him up a little bit. And he just tells me that he really had kind of earned that trust that we talked about earlier with all the guys so that when he was put in somebody's boat, he wouldn't even row hard during those seat races. He would actually let everybody else win it for them because everybody else in that boat felt they owed Don something. Maybe Don helped them out in some way the last week or did something, loaned, you know, loaned his time, loaned a little extra cash to someone up, picked them up from somewhere, whatever it was like, he would give and give and give and give all the time of himself. And then when he was in the boat and now he needed something, he didn't even have to ask for it. Everybody was desperate to pay Don back. He didn't have to do anything but look behind him in the boat and say, all right, guys, let's have a good five-minute row right here. And he said, all I did is row nice and easy, set the boat up, which balanced the boat, and let everybody else win the race for him. And that concept, what he did is he he built this trust. He leveraged human emotion in a way that people, like I said before with Tom and myself, people were more afraid of letting him down than they were about worrying about whether they were going to be seat raced next to one. Were they going to be too tired? Were they going to wear themselves out winning for Don and then not be able to win for themselves? They didn't even think that far ahead. All they knew is that Don got in their boat. I owe Don. That guy did me a solid last week, last month, whatever it was. And now I've got to pay him back right now. I mean, it's Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant leadership. And if you think about Don and how he was, like you said, now you're always there. You're there. You, Jason, are there. Don was there for all of his teammates in so many other ways than, than just the task at hand. And that's what really struck me. And as we think about hospitality and making others feel comfortable, it's that service mentality. Yeah, he knows if he's there showing up and giving for others, they will perform for him. And I think that this can translate into all of our lives in such an incredible way. Put others first, then you, th you fill that karma pool and it comes back to you. Yeah, we hear this term servant leadership and it's become, unfortunately, it's become a cliche um, because I think people say without really knowing what they're saying, they just know it's a nice little buzz phrase. But servant leadership is, is, 
in my, there's a lot of ways to lead. It is, in my opinion, the best way to lead. This idea that we're, I'm going to serve others all the time so that when I have to ask something of somebody else, not only are, they're not going to say, oh, he's my boss, I have to do this. He's going to say, I, I want to do this. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to pay this thing back, to pay it forward. And that, and that, that is great. I mean, there was this moment in my second row where we broke the world record in the Atlantic. We get hit by the storm, you know, 500 miles away from the finish line. We, we thought it was going to be easy rowing for the last 500 miles. And we get hit by the storm, knocks us back. And we realized that basically after the storm, for the next five days to break the world record, we have to row 80 miles a day, which by the way, is 10 miles above world record pace. I mean, 80 miles a day is just like, it's, it's unheard of. Like to be able to do one or two in the course of the entire crossing is amazing enough, but we have to string five in a row. And when I, when I, you know, we just spent, Grant, we spent a month together, you know, in this boat doing all these things that we've been talking about. And, and before that, in the months leading up to it, as we were training together. So I came out of that cabin after doing the math, right? Saying, telling people that telling my three teammates who were, you know, looking at me saying, Hey, what's the numbers? What do we have to do? And I remember, I remember having a little cry inside the cabin before I came out because I was thinking to myself, man, we worked too hard. We, we deserve better than this. And I'm going to have to tell them this bad news and, and, and they deserve more than this. But once I collected myself, I went out there and I told them what we had to do. And the response w was, was amazing. I and mean, the response was the first guy to talk to said, Matt guy I actually rode with that best three boys around. He goes, Oh my God, they got it. He said, I thought you were going to say a hundred miles. Like this guy truly believed that he was relieved. He believed that this team could do 80 miles a day and everyone had similar responses. And so we told that, I told him, this is what we need to do. And they, they, they looked me and each other in the eye and said, all right. And then we were all so committed and for the next five days. We rode 79 miles, 94 miles, 92 miles, 88 miles, and broke the world record by about 13 hours um, five days later. And nobody talked about the world record in those five days. Nobody said words like me, 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 or I, I, I. It was all about what can I do for the person sitting next to me? And um, and, and how can how can we how can we get done these next five days the way that we need to do it? And it was just even if we didn't break the world record, I remember telling myself in my head, I just achieved it. Like I achieved the pinnacle of my athletic career. It, it is certainly the pinnacle of my, my leadership journey was I, I came out of that cabin with bad news that nobody took as bad news. And they were desperate to be able to pay this back, not just to me, but to each other as well, to this team. It was just an amazing, amazing moment in my life that, um, I, I, you know, they, they really, they really has shaped a lot of, of who I am moving forward. This idea of servant leadership, as you were talking about it, it made me think of JFK and I'm in DC right now, um, near Arlington cemetery. And that whole idea of ask not what your country or team interchangeable can do for you, but what you can do for your country or team. I think it makes us all stronger. And I feel like we've lost a lot of that. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that we live in a tumultuous world right now and, you know, it's, it's ever changing and we feel anxiety and we feel uncertainty. You know, we're all, we're all, we're scared and that's okay to say that. But I think when we do, you have a choice. You can either, you can either go in on yourself and just basically say, hey, look, I am only going to take care of number one right now. This is where I am. Or you can look for opportunities to do two things, to help the ones that are less strong than you and to lead and ask for help for the ones that are stronger than you. And that's what we do as a microcosm in these boats. Every time you do one of these crossings, you will numerous times be the weakest person in the boat and the strongest. And when you're the weakest person in the boat, you've got to be able to say, I'm not having a good day. This is what I need. And sometimes that need is something that I need you to do something for me. I need you to to, to, to cook a meal for me. I need you to take an extra 15 minutes of my shift. Um, maybe it's, I just need to be by myself and be locked into my headphones right now and my music, because I, I just got to get through this. Mm. And, and, and your teammates will understand and respect that about you. And then when you're on the strongest part, you're like, I'm feeling great today. I, I got good sleep. I've been eating well. My body has responded to everything that I've been doing for it. That's your opportunity to look around and be like, who needs my help right now? Who, who can use? And that's that servant side right there. That's that servant part of it. And you don't, again, we don't have to be 
you don't have to be the skipper of the boat to be a leader in the team. You know, I was the captain of my Sonoma State team that first year, but I certainly wasn't, wasn't being a leader. There was other people that were leading a lot better on that team than I was um, without the little, without that, you know, the C on their chest. And um, that's the difference right there. And it's reminding me how, whether you're the skipper, the captain, the CEO, whatever CC you want to be, the president. Okay, so you are a leader, but at the most important times, those leaders serve the ones that are around them and the need, need them the most. That's how they got there. You know, yeah. that's how I believe that's how they got there. I mean, I was just talking to a CEO of a financial institution um, just last week and, and, and his entire, his entire messaging was about this idea that he is only there to serve everybody else. And, and, and like, and I believed him too, you know, it was, it was an amazing message that he, he continued almost, almost ad nauseum to be talking about. And, and it was just an amazing, it was just an amazing message that he had. It's like, I'm here for everybody else. Like that's what, I, that's my job as a CEO. And I thought that, you know, what an amazing thing to be telling everybody who's looking up to you to say is that I'm here for you. How can you, how, what do you need from me? Another amazing thing, which really resonated with me as you were saying it was when you said you had to do 80 miles a day and then you did 79 and then outperformed. I'm a big believer that we're all big kids. We all have our own library cards and the clearer and more transparent that we can be with our teams and our clients and everyone around us, it allows us to make adjustments that we need to do to perform. And just to hear that was very reassuring. And I appreciate that. And the, you've talked about a couple of times throughout this of just this fear, fear of death, exhausted, just being scared. What's keeping you up at night now? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Great question. And I think, you know, as somebody who, who owns a company that does leadership training courses, but we also do, I mean, I do these races. Um, I live I live in two very different worlds. I mean, I am a, I'm a husband and a father that lives in a small town in California, very community oriented over here. Uh, you know, we love going to the farmer's market. We've got a nice, robust social life here. Um, it's quaint, it's quiet, it's predictable. And I love that. And then when I leave here, I go and climb mountains, trek deserts, real oceans, and do these incredibly dangerous things. So the juxtaposition between my two worlds um, lends itself to keep me up in that for, for different reasons. I think on a personal level, you know, I kind of mentioned that I was a good athlete, but never the best on the team. And I kind of always felt like I was destined for a wall of silver medals. And I think you know, I, I, I played baseball my whole life. Didn't, didn't go pro, got injured, then went to rowing, um, but didn't qualify for the Olympics. Um, then do my first ocean row. You know, I told you the story about breakfast with Tom and I, but the reality was we had two guys leave. We didn't win the race. We didn't break a world record. Then I started changing things and things started working out. We broke the world record the next year. Then I go off and do a bunch of other things. You know, now all of a sudden we've got this success, but I'm still, I'm, uh, you know, an insecure human being like most of us. And I wonder, is it a fluke? Am I getting lucky? Am I just going through this part? Like, am I really being the leader that I keep talking about? Um, and of course the reality is no, I'm not because I'm constantly making mistakes and, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm losing, you know, teammates and friendships because of disagreements that we've had. And, you know, it's not perfect. We, you know, we, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm best friends with all on every single teammate I've ever had. That's not the case. We, some of them have come, some have gone, some left on good terms, some not so good terms. And it all of that adds up to like, can I be better? And, and am I just getting lucky, you know? And I know it sounds weird coming from me, but that's how I feel. So what keeps me up at night is like, am I really this, the, 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 the team captain and the leader that, that I, that I talk about, or am I, Am I just a facade? And that, you know, that sounds harsh, but th I have to keep proving that to myself. I will, you know, my next adventure will be next year and, and whatever I choose to do, like I, uh, I need to prove to myself that I'm, I'm going to put together and lead that team in the right way. So, you know, and then on, on a, on a, on a kind of professional team, um, you know, capacity where I'm with, with my, you know, with my business here, it's, it's really, you know, I, I, I hunt what I eat, you know, I, we, I don't, I don't, I work for myself and my family and my employees 
rely on the success of, of our, of our, uh, not only our ideas, but our ability to deliver on our ideas, do they work? And so, you know, that gets me nervous. And, uh, I, you know, I, again, am I, am I doing everything I can for everybody in, the, in this office that is going to be, make sure that they get everything they want while the company's still doing what they need to do. So. I love that. And it also brings me to our shared love of baseball. You played at a much higher level than I did, but it was also something that we both shared with our dads. And for me, it was that time where he was mine. I was his, it was, we were just there together. Um, I think for you, which comes down to the leadership, it's really showing up. It's the repetitions. And I think every leader must deal with failure and using, and why I love baseball so much is you fail 70% of the time, you're still going to the hall of fame. But if you're having the reps and getting up there and, and doing the work and just showing up every day, you're going to go somewhere. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I'd be hard pressed to find kind of a particular moment in my childhood where my dad wasn't very far away. And, you know, we can all be critical of our parents and those who raised us. They were too tough. They weren't tough enough. They did this for me. They didn't do that for me. We've all got those stories. But I think the thing that we need to be looking at is, were they there? Were they there making those mistakes, learning as they go, just like we're learning as we go? You know, I've got a two year old son and I, you know, in the short two years that he's been alive, I mean, I'm just constantly making mistakes and, and I will continue to be, but I can tell you one thing that I have control over is that I will be there. You know, I will be consistent and that moves forward as I, as I decide what I'm going to do next, what adventures and all that stuff is now, do I want to be away from my family for extended periods of time to go and chase down these, these dreams? I think there's, I think there's room for both, but those questions are a little tougher for me to answer. They, um, you know, 10 years ago, you told me to do something. I'm on a plane. I'm, I'm going to do it. And I got married and it was a little tougher. And then now I've got a kid and it's, it's, it's tougher still. So those types of, uh, but that, that idea of consistency and showing up and, and quantity time is going to be something that I'm going to make sure that, that that happens. Yeah. That quantity time, the repetition showing up, uh, you just said chasing down dreams and chasing and it's. It's really, I love how, I forget which, where it is, but it, one of your last chapters, you have a quote from Herman Melville and for Moby Dick, and it's like that white whale. So what's the, what's the white whale that you're chasing and what's exciting you most about the future? Well, um, I still, I always say like, I always say, would the 10 year old Jason be proud of me today? You know, like the guy who doesn't care about money and you know, the kid, I should say, didn't care about money, but was building forts in the backyard and was you know, was daydreaming. I was a big daydreamer. I guess I still am. And I always kind of check in with him and just wonder like, would, would he be proud of where we went? You know, where it's easy for us to make these like small concessions. And I'll, I, I kind of, without trying to give you too many of these little one-liners, um, you know, we hear, we hear this phrase and this idea, and this, this, this answer your question, I promise, but this idea that we hear, we say it all the time, we say life, life is short. We, we will quote that life is short. And I actually disagree with that. I actually think that life is, 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 is long. In fact, whether it's short or long actually just kind of depends on what you're comparing it to. But I think we believe that life is long more than we believe life is short, because if we truly believe that life is short, we'd be going and doing everything that we've ever wanted to do. We, 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 you know, we'd be, we'd be, taking those, you know, piano lessons, we'd be learning that second language. We'd be asking that girl out of the coffee shop that we see come in every day that we wish we had the nerve to do. We'd be doing all these things because we are truly believed that life is short. I may not have another chance. Life is finite and it's fleeting. But I think the reality is that we all kind of have this deep seated belief that we'll always have more time. You know, we'll have a second chance. We'll, I'll, I'll do it next year when I'm not as busy. I'll ask around next time she comes in when I'm wearing something a little nicer, whatever it is. And in this, this, this deep seated belief that life is long, I think enables us to make these little tiny concessions throughout our, our life. And before we know, it, we look back at a certain age and say, God, when did I give up on my dreams? When did I give up on all this, all these things I was going to do? Well, the reality is it wasn't one time. You didn't just say, Hey, I'm going to give it up now. You know, you just made small concessions because you always just said, Hey, we've got more time. We can do this later. I got to take this, I got to take this promotion now. Yeah, it means that I'm probably not going to be able to do these things, but I got to take it now. We'll do with those later. Then you look back and you realize, wow, I've just made a, a number of concessions throughout the you know the last decade or two of my life, and now 
I'm upset with myself. And we're all guilty of that, myself included. But what I try to do is really try to change the way I think about life and to really, really believe, not just say I do, but believe that life is short. And, and, and to, to, to make decisions based on the fact that, that this could be the last time I'll even have the opportunity to say yes or no to this thing. So if you say, what is the next thing for me? Like, I will always do these adventures. Like, this is for me is important. Um, I think maybe I'm largely done with oceans, but I, I, I've been looking to, you know, the world's greatest rivers and being able to navigate those. And, and so those will always be a part of my life. And I've created a world around in my community where not only am I supporting these things, but, you know, even my wife, she's, she's, she's my, my biggest support, but she's also somebody who helped pushes me in that direction to make sure that I'm doing the things I need to do to get ready for the next one. And so those I'll always be hopefully trying to make that 10 year old self happy because there's a situation where we, we encourage 10 year olds to dream. You want to be an astronaut? You can be one. Then all of a sudden they turn a certain age and then we think that these same things are ridiculous. Like why would a 38 year old want to still be an astronaut? That's too bad because maybe he's going to have a harder time at 38 than he would at 10. But like, it's really unfortunate that, that we place these kind of restrictions on people when they get to be a certain age, it's like, go get a job. So anyway, that's a long diatribe, but I, I hope that that resonates with people. Well, I, I love the image of the 10 year old Jason, because to think about that net, your dad built in the backyard with the T-ball and the 120 balls you're hitting every day. Like that's the repetition. That's the work. That's the showing up, right? Yeah. And you're going to fail, but you're doing it. So if you could go, you right now, Jason, stand in front of your 10-year-old self by the bucket of balls and the tea, what advice do you give your 10-year-old self? And first I'd say, you know, you got to tie your shoes more because I feel like everything I see, every picture is my shoes are untied. So you got to tie the shoes more often. That would be the first thing I'd say. But, you know, um, I guess if I were to, if I were to, be able to place him and he would be able to listen to me this way. I would really encourage him to like understand the difference between like and love and the difference between enjoying something and being passionate about something. And I think one of the things with baseball and, and Dan, I do love baseball. I've been a fan of it my whole life. It was as a soundtrack of my entire childhood, Giants games on the radio in the garage and on TV in the family room. Um, season tickets with my dad at Candlestick Park, this miserable, miserable freezing piece of concrete um but i think i i i thought i loved baseball but i i really i loved my dad and he loved baseball it's truly a passion for him when i found out when i started rowing i, I really learned what love was and it's been easy it hasn't been work for me i love getting in boats and i love the fluid dynamics and i love the team element of rowing and that was the first time i think i really understood was when i was in college this this Oh my gosh, this is what love is. So not to say that he shouldn't have 10 year old Jason shouldn't continue to pursue baseball from there on out, but I would just wanted him to explore more opportunities so that he could figure out the difference between one thing and the other. I think I, one of the things I, I fear in this, where we are now is that kids are just, you know, it's so competitive. They're, they're constantly pressured to do the same sport year round. And then you got to get a semi-professional coach teaching you how to swing and throw a ball. And, oh my gosh, you're not tall enough. So now you got to get bigger. Let's get in weight classes. And so like say, I just wish that we could explore different sports, try different things, try cooking classes, try magic for all I care, you know, do whatever you want so that you can it's not so you can just find what you're good at. So you can find what love is and like is and what kind of love is and what passion is and what hatred is and be able to create a scale, you know, a spectrum of, of, of passions. And, um, how would I fit all that into a 10 year old Jason who's probably already lost interest in what I've said to by now? I don't know. I'd have to say it a better way than I just said it to you, but that's what I'd be talking about. You're just like, tie your fucking shoe. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know why every single home video and I'm my shoes aren't tied. It's like I should have gotten Velcro. Did I not know the time my shoes? I yeah. wore it. It's funny. Uh, my 13 year old daughter, I, I think I may have shared this with you, but she's very athletic. She's awesome. She's creative. She does all these things. But whenever I ask her, oh, why don't you try running? Why don't you try this? It's always no, 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 no. The one thing I said, I was like, don't like, there's this big rowing club near where we live. And she's like, I want to try rowing. I was like, you know, you might want to wait till you're a little bit older because it's pretty hard on your body, especially as a youngster. And you know what? 
she loves it. She's doing it. And it's because I said, probably not the best idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Reverse psychology. Nice job, Dan. I know. Don't do that. Don't eat your vegetables. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. Awesome. Well, Jason, I mean, this has been so incredible. Um, I thank you so much. Where can people find you? And we'll have all this in the show notes as well, but just give us a rundown. Cool. I mean, yeah. First of all, thank you, Dan. I really appreciate this. I cannot believe how fast that time just went by, but, um, you know, uh, find me on Instagram at Jason underscore T underscore Caldwell. Just search Jason Caldwell. You'll find me, um, is a great way to follow my adventures and see cool pictures of what I'm doing and where I'm traveling. Uh, you can always catch me on LinkedIn too, on the, on the business side of things. And, um, I'm always trying to post my thoughts and some articles in there and, and more of my kind of what we've been talking about today. So those are great ways to find me. Awesome. Uh, well, I want to thank you very much for your time. Cause this did go by so quickly, but like it, I loved it. No, it's great. I didn't, you, you're, you're awesome. Thank you for coming up to me and, uh, telling me, Hey, you should be on my podcast and, uh, and making me see where the connection is. And, uh, I got, I got an education, um, over this last couple of months and, and kind of just talking with you. So thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome, Jason. And this whole idea of gathering points, I think is really important to everyone in every aspect of our lives. And if this podcast has helped you think differently about delivering or receiving hospitality or being a servant leader, please let me know about it. Share the podcast with others and share it with a friend. And thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time.